Father, I pray that you would help us this morning to recognize your work in our life and in our church, that you would speak to us, and that we would leave here a little bit more in tune with Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Our text is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we'll get to that in a little bit. <clears throat> Last week, we talked about 2 Timothy 1.12, where Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And we, we, we spoke specifically about the need to focus upon Jesus. In the midst of that, sense, of that message, I said that the, it is important to know whom we have believed first, that that is more important than theology. But theology is still important. And we're going to get to theology this morning. Theology is the study of the nature of God. And throughout history, mankind has sought to understand the nature of our Creator. Those who believe in the Bible as the Word of God look to it in their study of God. And volume after volume after volume has been written in an attempt to explain how to understand this book, some sort of systematic theology, a system through, uh, which creates a lens through which we can look to see how we understand various passages of Scripture so that in our understanding of Scripture, we come from a, different, a specific perspective to say, ah, now it makes sense. And although I spent five years working on my Masters of Divinity and another ten years working on my doctorate at a theological seminary, I have always been somewhat uncomfortable with the concept of a systematic theology. Because the Bible isn't a systematic theology. And it seemed as though I could always find nagging questions about every systematic theology. Uh, loopholes, failure in logic, uh, some just ignoring passages as though they didn't really exist. Now, I suggest to you that none of us should think that the Bible is a textbook of systematic theology. It is, a, in many ways, a history book teaching us the patterns of God's interaction with mankind and how He has reached to us to offer us reconciliation with the Almighty. Now, that's not to say that theology is not important. It is important to our faith. Good theology or orthodox theology, is important. There are doctrines which we really ought to get right. There are doctrines which distinguish those who are adherents to orthodox Christianity and those who are not. There are ways that we can gauge whether we are part of the family or not part of the family. Our understanding of biblical truth is essential to the church. The best way to discern error, of course, is to know truth. So theology is important. But the Bible isn't a textbook, and its writers did not leave us a systematic theology as such. The writers of Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote with broad strokes rather than in specifics, the type of specifics so often included in systematic theologies. And yet, with this background, we come to our text for this morning where Paul admonishes Timothy to do this. This is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. 
follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord. These two admonitions, follow the pattern and guard the deposit, form a basic challenge not merely to Timothy, but to all believers. What is the pattern that we are to follow? The pattern of sound words or teaching? And how do we guard the gospel deposit of faith which we have been given? This is a challenge for us today and probably for next week. So how do we follow the pattern? That's the first admonition from our text. Follow the pattern you have heard from me. And even though the writers of Scripture wrote in expansive terms, it does not mean that we are left to wonder what is true and what is false. It just means that we draw our theology from the whole of Scripture rather than merely from one or two verses. A text taken out of context is a pretext for a proof text and a proof text without supporting text is likely to draw the wrong conclusion. You simply don't make a theological position from one text. It is far too easy for us to practice eisegesis, that's a fancy term for reading into the text, so that we take our meaning and force it into the text, It's far too easy for us to practice eisegesis than exegesis, where we draw the meaning out of the text. So how do we follow the pattern of sound words or healthy words, which Paul talks about in our text? In order to answer that question, I set it as part of my life goal to understand what is the basic core truths of the gospel. What are the common beliefs which are of necessity held by every person who will spend eternity in glory. And so when I came to work on my doctorate in that 10-year period, I turned to numerous systematic theologies to a host of doctrinal statements of conservative denominations and the classic creeds of the church. And from these, I drew together and said, what, are our, what is our common faith? What things are foundational theologically? Back in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, Paul assured the church at Ephesus the church which Timothy is leading at the time that Paul writes to him in 2 Timothy. So Paul writes in, to this church, or talks to the church, it's recorded in Acts twenty twenty seven, where Paul assured the elders at the church of Ephesus that he had not failed to deliver to them the full counsel of God. Paul had spent approximately three years in Ephesus, laying a biblical foundation of theology which he assured them was complete. He obviously had a concept of what the full gospel meant. He had a concept of the sound words that he delivered to Timothy and which he now admonished both Timothy and us to hold to. Hold to the pattern of sound words of good doctrine. So in searching for an answer to what that pattern would be to ask myself, what is the full counsel of God? What is the, what are the foundational doctrines of the faith? I realized the Bible isn't a highly developed systematic theology. And you can hold to vastly different systematic theologies, but at the core of those that are Bible-believing are seven core doctrines. 
Seven foundational doctrines which flow out of an understanding of the picture painted by those broad strokes of the biblical writers. Healthy words, sound words, sound doctrine include seven core doctrines which make up the foundation of our common faith. It is why we can in the evangelical free church, embrace people from various theological traditions because we understand at the core of our belief are these seven doctrines. And there are other doctrines which are secondary, which we are willing to have disagreement on. And we decide we will not divide over the issues which are not at the core. Without a basic understanding of and a commitment to these seven doctrines, we have reason to question the orthodoxy of our faith. So here are the seven doctrines, and I have about two minutes for each doctrine, which means we are not going to make the second point today. The first is the doctrine of God. The doctrinal statement of the Evangelical Free Church states this, we believe in one God, Creator of all things, holy, infinitely perfect, eternally existing, in a loving unity of three equally divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, having limitless knowledge and sovereign power, God has graciously purposed from eternity to redeem a people for himself and to make all things new for his own glory." I think that we could do a whole series on the doctrine of God. At the core of what we believe is we believe in the Trinity. We believe in God the Father who is infinitely perfect. We believe in the three persons of the Trinity. And this is a dividing point for many people who want to be monotheists but don't want to believe in the Trinity. And so there are people who deny the deity of Jesus Christ or the deity of the Holy Spirit who are monotheists, but they don't believe in the same God that we believe in. And so as we understand our doctrine, we understand that it begins with an understanding of who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, creator of the universe. We also have a doctrine of Christ The doctrine of Christ is one which separates again. For those who deny Jesus Christ deny what is a part, an integral part of orthodox theology. Again, from the Free Church doctrinal statement, we believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, fully God and fully man, one person in two natures. Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father, our high priest and advocate. This doctrine of Jesus Christ is significant when it comes to understanding whether we are in the same family. For those that deny the deity of Jesus Christ deny an essential doctrine of Orthodox Christianity. Now you can hold to the deity of Jesus Christ, and you could be a Baptist, a Methodist, you can be a, a, an evangelical free, you can be a Presbyterian, you can be a Catholic and hold to the deity of Jesus Christ. And you can be any of those and hold to the do- correct doctrine of God. We differ in other points of theology, but of these things we come to agreement. That Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man, lived a sinless life, He wasn't merely a good prophet. He was, is, the Son of God, God incarnate, come to earth for us. The third doctrine, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit, in all that he does, glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. He convicts the world of its guilt He regenerates sinners, and in him they are baptized into union with Christ and adopted as heirs into the family of God. 
He also indwells, illuminates, guides, equips, and empowers believers for Christ-like living and service. We have an understanding that the Bible lays out for us who the Holy Spirit is. That he is our comforter who walks along the side of us, who baptizes us into the family, who holds us there, who convicts us of sin. We have this understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. Now, honestly, there are some denominations which have other things which they add to that, but they too hold to this basic doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we have a choice to make. If we have agreement on the essentials, are we willing to divide over the non-essentials? And the Holy Spirit is one of those places where the church of Jesus Christ has chosen division rather than unity. And I don't believe this pleases our Savior. The doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and the doctrine of Scripture... Frankly, I I believe you could make an argument that the doctrine of Scripture needs to come first because it is out of Scripture that we develop our understanding of the doctrine of God and of all the other doctrines. But we believe that God has spoken to us in the Scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, through the words of human authors. As the verbally inspired word of God, the Bible is without error in the original writings, the complete revelation of his will for salvation, and the ultimate authority by which every realm of human knowledge and endeavor should be judged. Therefore, it is to be believed in all that it teaches, obeyed in all that it requires, and trusted in all that it promises. Again, we have a very high view of Scripture. We don't worship Scripture, but we turn to it to inform us of our life. And for those that say, well, I believe in God, I just don't believe in the Bible, this is a dividing line. For the standard of our doctrine, the standard of our behavior flows out of the inspired Scripture. So... As Orthodox believers, as evangelical believers, these four doctrines have have laid a foundation for us in order for us to understand the parameters of who's a part of the kingdom and who's not. And if you're familiar with other churches, there are churches which deny the Scripture. They they see it just as a a book. Uh, Maybe a good book, but not an authoritative book. And part of what it means to be an orthodox believer, an evangelical believer, is that we believe that the Scripture actually has the right to say something to us about how we should lead our lives. That it can say something to us about the things we should do and the things we should not do. We hold a high view of Scripture out of which we draw our understanding of the core doctrines of the church. The, third, uh, the, the next doctrine is the doctrine of man. We believe that God created Adam and Eve. He did so in his image, but they sinned when tempted by Satan. In union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under his wrath. Only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be restored, reconciled, and renewed. Again, a a dividing point for many people. And before we get too hung up in the the issue of creation, is it a seven-day creation, seven epochs? Is it theistic evolution? I don't know. I do know this. The Bible said God created. His manner of creation, people debate about. I would come back to this. Whether you believe in theistic evolution or a literal seven day of creation, do you believe 
that God created? Yes. There are some things which we have to take by faith. Just like science takes things by faith. Science leads you back and says, at the beginning of the world, there was a big bang. They don't explain how that came about. By faith, they hold to a big bang. By faith, we hold to God creating. And then the issue of mankind. There are many people who they believe that man is good. You know, the more I read the things which are happening in our society right now, the Me Too movement and all the things that men and women do, I think it's a really hard position to take to say mankind is good. We are evil. We can think of all sorts of ways to hurt one another, to abuse one another. Even if you didn't believe that we inherited a sinful nature from Adam, you would have to suspend all reality not to believe that we are evil by choice. Mankind is in trouble. We are full of sin and hatred and jealousy and bitterness and anger. And we are alienated from our Creator. We do not have a high view of mankind. Mankind left on his own is going to really screw things up. We need Jesus. Which leads us to our next doctrine. The sixth of doctrines, if you're keeping track. It's the doctrine of salvation. We believe that God commands everyone everywhere to believe the gospel by turning to him in repentance and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. Orthodox Christians always bring us to Christ. There is salvation in no other. There is no other way to heaven. We may not be able to explain the the hypothetical situations of someone in deep, darkest Africa. How can they get to heaven and how can God judge them? How can God judge him when we take the first point, the, the last point, that mankind is our sinners by choice? That we are alienated from God. And there is salvation in only Jesus Christ. Of course, this is a huge dividing line. For there are many people who want to believe that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something sincerely. But that's not what the Scripture says. There is salvation in Jesus Christ. This is part of the core, the foundational doctrines of the church. It is part of what Paul is saying to Timothy is the good, sound words, the healthy words, the pattern that he has given, that there is salvation in no other. The final doctrine that it makes up these seven foundational doctrines of the church is the doctrine of the end times. We believe that God will raise the dead bodily and judge the world, assigning to the unbeliever to condemnation and eternal conscious punishment and to the believer to eternal blessedness and joy with the Lord in the new heaven and the new earth to the praise of His glorious grace. We do not believe that We should eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and there's annihilation after this earth. We don't believe you need to grab for all the gusto you can give, get because you only go around once in life. We believe that there is true life after this fake life. We believe there's a heaven and a hell. We do not believe that only the good go to heaven and the, and the, the evil just cease to exist. We believe in a place called heaven and a place called hell. It is what the church of Jesus Christ has believed for 2,000 years. 
These seven doctrines make up the core of our faith. The sound teaching, the healthy teaching that Paul refers to when he encourages Timothy to follow the pattern the sound, of sound words which he has delivered. And if you've been here for a while, you know this is one of the reasons that I track my preaching to ensure that I deliver to you on a regular basis these seven foundational doctrines which make up the heart of our church, of our faith. Paul knows it is not merely head knowledge that believers need. For it is possible to hold to a pattern of sound words, to be able to recite a catechism or defend a doctrinal position without actually embracing it and without actually embracing Jesus Christ. That is why in verse 12 he said, I know whom I have believed. Now, knowing we believe in Jesus, let's talk about the pattern of life. And he's going to remind us next week, he's going to challenge us next week to guard the deposit. And I have some suggestions of how we can do that, but you're going to have to wait for next week. But for now, review in your mind these seven doctrines. Do you believe in the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the doctrine of, man, of, man, of Scripture, the doctrine of man, of salvation, and of the end times? For these doctrines make up the core of what it means to be in the family of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you that you have given us the scripture painted in broad strokes from which we understand the core doctrines of the faith, the foundational doctrines. Help us, Lord Jesus, to follow the pattern of sound words revealed in the scripture. Amen. I only made it through one of the points. <laughs> now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you grace. Amen.